lot of people start a keynote like this by saying that the world has changed so much and the world's changing so fast and it's changing faster than it ever has before. And that's all true. You know, if you think about it, Wikipedia has archived so much of the world's information all in one place we can access for free. And with YouTube and with Khan Academy, we can go on and watch videos and learn about content and learn how to do certain things at any time that we want. And with video calls like Skype, we have access to just about anybody all over the world and are able to communicate face to face with them in real time. I don't know about you, but I was always told by my parents not to talk to people that I didn't know and not to get in cars of people that I didn't know and not to talk to strangers on the internet. But if you think about it with apps like Uber and Lyft and the ride sharing that we have these days, that's kind of what we're doing, isn't it? You know, we're summoning people that we don't know, strangers from the internet to come and pick us up in their own cars and then to take us away to somebody else's house who we don't know, who's a complete stranger, so we can pay them money and stay at their house through apps like Airbnb. So things have definitely changed. However, in a lot of ways, the world hasn't really changed. And one place where you can see this very clearly is in schools. And I don't mean that in a bad way, because the, the very nature of teaching and learning, a lot of that is still based on the same fundamental principles. You know, it's still very much our job to help students find information that can change the way that they see the world and to help them to make sense of that information so they can process it and put it in their paradigm of how they see the world, to help them practice certain skills so that they can get better, and then to build our relationships with them. You know, it's kind of the glue that holds everything together. Now, technology is a piece of this whole teaching and learning world. It has a very valuable place but I don't think that it should be the focus of what we do as teachers. I like to compare how we use technology in the classroom to a toolbox. So if you think about it with a toolbox, you know all of the tools that are inside of this toolbox and you know that they can help you do very specific things. But the way that a carpenter approaches their toolbox isn't the same as we do with our digital tools in the classroom sometimes. Case in point, if I get into this toolbox and I get this hammer and I'm looking at this hammer and I'm thinking, hmm, this is a shiny hammer. I haven't had this for very long. I wonder what I could make with a hammer. It's kind of ridiculous for a carpenter to base their projects that they want to build on the tool that they're excited about playing with. But the reality is, is that many times we use our digital tools this way in the classroom. We get excited about one particular one and we start to think, what can we do with it? Instead of how can this tool be used for the bigger purpose of what we want to learn? Now, technology does have such a huge role in education and what we're going to be able to do in education going forward. So the big question we've got to ask ourselves, I think, is how does it fit? How do we help it to fit into what we want to do so that we can make the most out of it? I think there are a couple things that we can do. One thing we can do is to start with the end in mind. You know, this reminds me of Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it also takes me very much back to my teacher prep program where we were taught to do reverse curriculum design. And this is very much the same idea. It's the idea that if we want to use a digital tool, let's look at our goals and our objectives and the skills that we want kids to be able to develop. And then we think, how can we reverse engineer those? And are these the kinds of tools that are going to help us to do that? And you know, for me, being a high school Spanish teacher, one way that I saw this happen was by using video calls in my classroom. Part of learning a language is learning about the cultures where the language is spoken. And so instead of me trying to teach out of a textbook and show students exactly how the culture happens by looking at pictures and reading words, we reverse engineered it to think of how could they have an experience with that culture. So we used video calls. I was able to Skype a class of English language learners in Valencia, Spain, and we partnered together and we got to talk about our culture. We got to share our languages 
And it connected with students in a way that we couldn't otherwise. And it was because I think we kept in mind of what was the end purpose. So we started with the end in mind. Secondly, I think we've got to remember that we don't have to use it all. You know, you come to something like today and you're going to see all sorts of things that you can use in your classroom. You may come away from the day and you may have eight different digital tools and you may have five practical ideas that you can start using and one big picture framework that just totally blew your mind. And now you've got all of that stuff. And it's very common when you've got all of that stuff to feel overwhelmed. And you start looking at the breadth and the depth of it and you think, my goodness, how am I gonna fit in time to do all of this and to learn all of this? You know, that feeling of overwhelm is pretty common. And I heard somebody say something interesting about overwhelm once. They said, overwhelm is not the problem of having too many choices. It's not knowing where to start. And so in this case, start small. Find something that you think has a lot of potential to move the needle for learning in your class. You know, something that you can bring in that can have a big impact on how much students retain and how much they learn about the world. So you just start small and you learn that particular tool or that particular idea. And you help your students learn it and you get good at it. And then once you've got a handle on that thing, then maybe it's time to move on to something else. You know, when we bombard our students with digital tools and with lots of new ideas, it's as overwhelming to them as it is to us. And so I think we've got to be very judicious about what it is that we bring into the classroom. You don't have to use it all. Pick the one thing you think is going to move the needle for learning in your class the most and then go try that. The next one is that no tech at all, no tech at all is okay sometimes. It is an option. It may feel a little bit like you've got to keep that a secret, but the truth is, is that if we try to do everything with technology, we're really only using a small subset of the opportunities that we have to engage our kids because there's so much else that we can do too. You know, you look at activities that you can do with paper sometimes, maybe with paper and scissors, you know, that's, that's real hands-on and manipulative and it's using the senses of our touch. There's the art of conversation, which feels like it's dying sometimes. You know, you see students with their faces down in their devices. You see adults with their faces down in their devices too. And they get stuck down in there and we start to think, oh my goodness, can we not have like a human to human moment here? Closing up those Chromebooks and flipping over those iPads to have real honest conversations is a great thing. Even when we use something like Play-Doh to create something and to manipulate something or use a piece of tin foil and shape it into something that matches what we're learning those can have a really, really great impact too. And they don't have to have anything to do with technology. Now, the great thing about the technology that we have is that sometimes we can capture those moments through a picture or through a video and then preserve them or remix and do something with them. You know, it's that whole idea of blended learning, bringing together the, on, the best of digital learning and the best of face-to-face -face learning. So putting that technology away sometimes, totally okay. Number four, help your students to find an audience. If you think about it, how many of the traditional activities that students do in classes every day are done for an audience of one, the teacher? You know, they do that worksheet or they write that essay and they turn it into the teacher. The teacher grades it, puts some comments on it and gives it right back to them. It's an audience of one. The teacher is the only person that ever ends up seeing it. So what can we do to grow the audience of students' work to add a little bit of that extra motivation, you know, so that they see that they're doing something that might actually matter to somebody else. And so that could be something as small as how can we share it within a small group or how can we make it available to the entire class or how can we go even bigger than that? 
You know, if you want to keep it within your class, something as simple as creating a topic in Flipgrid where students are able to record a video response to a question or a prompt, now everybody in the class is able to see that. That grows the audience in a small way. What if we take student work and we put it on a class website or in a class seesaw class or we're able to take that class website and put some exemplary work on it and share it with the community, share it with parents, share it with other people who are interested in what's going on in the schools. And now all of a sudden, once we've shared that widely and they're able to see that student work, now students have an audience, especially if they're able to interact with that audience and really truly see that the audience saw it and appreciated what they had to do. And it's easier than ever to be able to create an audience, access an audience in ways that, that we weren't able to do before technology. And the last one, number five, is to find a bigger purpose for students. And I love how Dan Pink puts this in his book, Drive. And he talks about how what science has learned about what motivates people is different from the way that we try to motivate people based on what we've experienced in our lives. There's this disconnect. He says it's a disconnect between what business does and what science knows. And I would argue that there's a disconnect between what education does and what science knows. And Pink talks about how there are these three main drivers for motivation. You've got mastery, the hope of learning how to do something at a really high level. You've got autonomy, doing something or learning something on your own, you know, being self-driven. But then there's also purpose. You know, the idea of doing something bigger than yourself, pursuing something that has a bigger purpose than just yourself. And there's so much of what we do in class that can be tied to a bigger purpose than just turning in a paper to the teacher. So I think we can ask ourselves the simple question, how can what we're learning improve the lives of other people? We could start with something small, like in my foreign language classes, we could take documents that were given to parents who speak another language and help translate those documents so that they've got something in their own language. Or it could be something bigger. You know, for instance, where I've seen classes that have partnered with big service organizations or with other classes just like them in another country to help get them clean drinking water, to help build bridges so that they're able to go to school, to help get them school supplies. And now all of a sudden our learning has meaning beyond ourselves. So if we want to give it that extra layer of motivation, that extra spark, that can actually change our students' lives. We can find a purpose that's bigger than themselves. So today you're certainly gonna learn about a lot of apps and tools and websites. You'll learn about things like Pear Deck and Sphero and Merge Cubes and virtual and augmented reality like Google Cardboard or maybe something like Flipgrid or you might hear about some Android apps. Okay, Android apps aren't really that popular at events like this, but I mean, isn't he adorable? I just had to find a way to get this guy in the video somehow. There's gonna be a wide variety of things that are available to you, but we've gotta keep our eyes on the prize, on what the goal is. And the goal is not to use great tools. The goal is to create amazing human beings. And so as we learn about these different things we can use in our classroom, I hope that's the lens that we look at it through, is how can we create amazing learning opportunities with these and not just use technology for the sake of using technology? How can this change things in our classes? How can it move the needle for us? So as you progress forward today, if we can keep our eyes focused on those things, that's what's gonna make the big difference. And if we do that, our students will thank us. And I think the world will thank us too.